Panel leader, attack, go! My name is Arne Howard from the Kennedy School, um, and it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator uh, for this evening's event, uh, Juliet Kayan, who's one of my colleagues here in the Kennedy School. Uh, but, uh, perhaps more relevant <coughs> than that to uh, the evening's activities, uh, Juliet has uh, worked in the federal government and in the state government in homeland security related uh, functions. Uh, early in her career, she worked with the Justice Department. Um, as executive assistant to Janet Reno, the Attorney General, um, came to the Kennedy School after serving on the uh, National Commission on Terrorism in the late 90s, uh, left the Kennedy School for the first time uh, to be uh, Governor Patrick of Massachusetts, um, Homeland Security Advisor and also Under Secretary of Public Safety for Homeland Security, and then went into the Obama administration as uh, Assistant Secretary of DHS for Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, we're very glad to have her back now at uh, uh, the Kennedy School. And she also um, has a side career in journalism, having been uh, earlier a uh, uh, columnist on national security issues for the Boston Globe and now a commentator for CNN. Thank you. <laughs>
the conflict, uh, trying to save the first African American uh, pilot in the U.S. Navy, and uh, and through that adventure, uh, received uh, the Medal of Honor from the President. And the interesting thing about uh, Captain Hunter is he is probably the most humble, honorable, sole person I've ever met. What a combination. He is a warrior among warriors. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to start at this end with uh, Lieutenant General Michael Duby. Uh, he is uh, married to a lovely lady, Amy. Uh, he is the Deputy Commander of uh, U.S. NORTHCOM and Vice Commander of NORAD, the U.S. element of NORAD, North American Aerospace Defense Command. He is a command pilot with over 2,000 hours in the F-16 uh, Falcon, and uh, he at Northern Command is responsible for the defense of Canada, Mexico, Bahamas, and the United States. An interesting fact about General Duty is his love of aviation actually started in 19... 79 when he enlisted in all services the army oh, as a soldier <laughs> in, the, in the Vermont National Guard in the 150th aviation battalion became an armor officer and then saw the light and jumped to the air <laughs> <laughs> Admiral Paul Zumpong did I say that even close <laughs> sorry, sorry he is accompanied by his lovely wife Fran thank you for being uh, he is the 25th Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, he wears the Cutterman insignia for operational service in the Coast Guard Cutters. He is uh, responsible for 88,000 Coast Guard personnel as part of the oldest maritime defense force in America, established in 1790. Interesting fact about the Admiral, uh, I, I find this interesting, <laughs> is he has five MSMs, and he has an O device on one of those MSMs. And uh, I had no idea what that was. So I went to my favorite place for all knowledge, uh, Wikipedia, and, uh, <laughs> and, and which is always correct. <laughs> and, <it's, laughs> and it says this, it's an operational distinctu distinguishing device for meritorious missions in an operational, quote, hands-on nature. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. These two fine gentlemen are definitely warriors among warriors. Now, last but not least, General Frank Grass and his lovely wife, Pat, who is with him. Thank you also for being here. He is the 27th Chief of the National Guard Bureau. He is a member of the Joint Chief of Staffs. He's responsible for 470,000 soldiers, airmen, and civilians in the National Guard as part of the oldest military force in the United States, established in 1636. And I heard that before. <laughs> for those of you that don't know the inside of that, there's this this thing about this gaggle that happened, this militia gaggle that happened in the 1500s, and they uh, and somebody threw the word militia out, so they like to think that they established the National Guard in the 1500s. But we all know that in 1636 in Massachusetts, <laughs> <laughs> the official birthplace and time of the of the uh, National Guard. So the interesting thing uh, about General Grass is that other than uh, looking good for 378 years old, <laughs> do you know he has held every rank in the U.S. Army except four? That's, he's held 15 of 19 different ranks from private all the way through four-star general. He also is a warrior among warriors. Well done. <laughs> And, and I'd like to say, uh, I, I, I'm not responsible to introduce uh, Juliet, but I do have an interesting fact before I step down. Did you get it from Wikipedia? <laughs> <laughs> How did she go? <laughs> she was a finalist last year in 2013 for the Pulitzer Prize for Comics. Yes. So, well done. We're reporting on calls from 
of all things, women in combat to oil spills. Can yes, you imagine? I know. Anyway, you are a professional among warriors. Thank you. And thank you. For thank you very thank much. Thank you all. together uh, for their executive program as well as uh, this evening's festivities. So thank you. <laughs> we're going to speeches tonight because we want to hear from you and we want to hear from them, but I, I did want to get uh, uh, every panelist to maybe spend two or three minutes and just sort of putting their role and where they are right now in perspective uh, or in place in terms of domestic security emergency because a lot of people come from different roles here. So I'll, I'll begin with you. Thank you, Julia. Well, first, the uh, interesting thing about the chief, and many of the folks in this room know this, that uh, the chief of the National Guard doesn't command and control anything. <laughs> and uh, as Secretary Hagel walked by one day and we were standing in the meeting, and I forget, I think it was the Ferguson event, he just looks at me as we talked about Ferguson and the governor and the tag and his role. And his lawyer he just told me, you have nothing to do with this. Uh, this is a law enforcement action. And then he looked at me and he says, you have a difficult job. Uh, it's not really that difficult uh, because my job is to find resources for the men and women of the National Guard that execute the missions. And, uh, and then to take information from many of you in this room and share that information Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and to the Secretary, and even sometimes up to the President, and then collaborate with so many folks. Paul and I sit in Monday and Friday meetings together to the coffee meetings. And, uh, and then also with FEMA and DHS. So partnerships, and if I can give you one word, partnerships and building those early are so critical. And I have just a tremendous partnership with all the editors general, and I know that you know, they carry the, carry the heavy load out there during the crisis. Okay. First, I'll start with or some of our authorities, and it really begins for the Coast Guard with Presidential Policy Directive Number 8, but as the comment of the Coast Guard, I'm actually an Operations Commander as well, so it's a little bit unique as a service chief. Uh, I have reserve call-up authority as well, uh, and then we're also guided by the National Response Framework, which lays out the emergency support functions, and then it assigns a lead federal agency that. But in the middle of all of that, who coordinates all of that activity? Because what you strive for is unity of effort. And this always drove General Jacoby crazy. Because you don't have command and control authority. You might within your Title X authority, but if you're reaching across federal, state, local, tribal, you do not have command and control authority. And then you ask yourself, what is a complex capacity? Well, first of all, you know it's complex when my line of authority goes from me to the secretary to either Susan Rice or um, Lisa Monaco to the president. Uh, we did that with Ebola. But then you know it's really complex when either Dux Leonard or Lenny Marcus shows up to provide the next case study. <laughs> so, I, so I've had the pleasure of posting that as okay on the next case study. Uh, but I think what you'll see, and we'll bring this out in question and answer, I mean, we live in a very flat information age right now. It's what may be local is going to immediately become national. Uh, and then it depends on what season it is with midterm elections, and that may become volatile. Uh, and they're not just complex. So some of the challenges you face, but we have some pretty good authorities in place. But you, what you really strive for though is to have unity of effort in the absence of bona fide unity of command, especially when we look at domestic catastrophes. I think uh, what the Admiral was just saying is, is what is one of the hardest parts for that Northern Command. So Northern, Northern Command is the, the active they interface in the home. And you have to step back and realize why is Northern Command even around? So it was started in, in 2002 after the 911 Commission because there was no military force at September 11th that was responsible for the homeland. So if you look at the globe, and for those of you who aren't in the military, if you look at the globe, the globe is broken up into pieces, geographic regions that have specific United States military leadership that's responsible for those regions, except for the United States, or North America. So after September 11th, they established Northern Command, and 
they, it made sense to align it with NORAD, and NORAD is responsible for the protection of North America. It's been around since 1958, so it made sense to put it there. The, so the number one job was Homeland Defense, and we talked about this to, to some of you today, but the second thing that became apparent was after Katrina in 2005, <coughs> is that no one was really doing what the Admiral just said. No one was on a disaster. There was no one who was really coordinating or commanding uh, in the homeland for something as important as something like Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina. And Hurricane Katrina, I would say, falls in the box of not being a complex catastrophe. It was a big disaster, but it wasn't what we would consider a complex catastrophe. We can talk about that more in detail. But uh, here, here's the point. After Katrina, because, uh, and I was pretty candid today to the lunch uh, group, um, you know, we didn't do a very good job with Katrina. I mean, we did some things well, but overall, we didn't have unity of effort. And so the Congress got involved and it came up with this construct called a dual status commander. We can drill down that if people want to later. But we do have now the mechanism, and we have exercised it, and now we have had real world event like Hurricane Sandy, where we actually use the dual status commander in New Jersey and New York to do exactly what the Admiral just said. And the partnership thing, we'll talk a lot about partnerships for the next hour. So, uh, thank you all. <laughs> so I want to begin with uh, where you are now. You're all at the top of your professions. Uh, in a world that didn't exist when you started, first of all, there was no Department of Homeland Security, the notion of having uh, 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 not natural disasters like what we've had since 911. Uh, the threat has changed with Lone Wolves or Boston Marathon, uh, and there's no more uh, So you must have stumbled sometimes. Uh, and so I want to begin, and I want to start with you. Uh, in your career, uh, what was the biggest mistake you have made in terms of integrating, uh, in terms of you know this new world that you? that you all have inherited. And what did you learn from it, and, and what advice would you give to, to everyone out here? Uh, I can go back to the Marielle Vogler. Uh, and so I was in charge of a patrol boat back in 1980. Yeah, I've been around since 1790. <laughs> <laughs> you give me the name of your doctor. <laughs> so that year, we had 100,000 uh, human refugees leave for the United States. And uh, the Coast Guard, when we move forces, you know, we can pull from across the country. So when I look at, you know, we've got a number of adjutant generals here, and it's pretty difficult to rock from one state to backfill another uh, and have the governors come to agreement on that. So if I look back on the Mariel Boltlift, we were very dependent, quite honestly, on NGOs, non-governmental organizations. The acronym data didn't even exist back then, but we had health care, we had private criminals, we had a whole gamut. They're all on my, my 95 foot patrol boat. I had 200 at any given time. But we didn't have that smooth handoff across the interagency. Um, and so I would call my boss, but we would run it up our respective agency chains of command, but there was nothing to coordinate that activity at the highest level. Obviously, we didn't have 24 hour news cycles back then. We worked in a digital era, but we really suffered in terms of our ability to collaborate, coordinate. Um, and as a result of that, you know, we had migrants on a little patrol boat for one gate boat. Uh, they were on there for so long. So it's a real challenge of just getting whole of government to work together. Uh, and so we've come a long way since the 1980s. We look at the struggles we have today, but, you know, we really struggled back in those days. And was that just because the notion that you would have to cut across those different boundaries had, it had never been experienced before in such a big way with the boat lift? Well, we were naive of. This was really uh, a black eye for the Carter administration. Uh, and I would say it's taken us probably up to Katrina as a service to really be politically savvy of, of what is really taking place around you. So when we had the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, that yeah, was a big oil spill. But step back a little bit. You know, we had just allowed Deepwater drilling to resume. Now something goes awry. Five Republican states are impacted by oil leading up to midterm elections. And if you'll step back and look at that picture of what's taking place around you, so we're a little bit more savvy then 
And then how do you keep everybody you know, in the box? And so for the Coast Guard, we detail, we have, well, Julia Hine was one of those, uh, detailed the number of our senior officers for every mayor, parish president, every governor, and a Coast Guard military liaison officer. So they didn't like what was happening in their state. Talk to our senior officer first. Don't talk to CNN. You know, tell me, and I'll put you in a chopper, put you in a boat, and then how do you work that down to the most local level? But even when I look at Deepwater Horizon, every plan fails you know, with first contact with Pentagon. We have area contingency plans, states signed off on it. And so this was a Clean Water Act response. If you look at Deepwater Horizon, and it's federally led. And it impacted states that are very accustomed to the Stafford Act, which is led by the state. And so the governors are wanting to call the shots when, in fact, they don't have the authority to do so. So that was a very delicate bridge that we had to build um, literally on the fly. Um, but seeing the bigger political picture and then how do you change the narrative with CNN? Uh, I can't win a tar wall. Okay. And so any time a reporter says that there's no guitar ball, they say, hey, guess what? So we moved the big ship offshore with all the flaring of gas. We had about 50 ships out there, the heavy artillery, if you will. And all the reporters will, how do I get on the ship? And all of a sudden, the camera lens shifted to what was happening offshore and what was happening on the beach. And if people want to ask questions more, I, I can we wrote a whole book on it. <laughs> I, I told this vignette um, earlier, but I think it's at lunch, so some of you heard this, but I think it's, when I think about mistakes, um, it was probably a couple of things that I learned during Irene when I was the acting general in Vermont. So the very first morning, uh, there was, there was a, I, I, we made a lot of mistakes, but I made some of them first. But the first one was probably Sunday afternoon of the hurricane. So it had slowed down from a hurricane, a tropical storm, when it got over the, over the land. And then it was supposed to go over Concord, New Hampshire. It supposed to, the original track was over New Hampshire, like a bowling alley. And so we thought we would be helping New Hampshire, maybe Massachusetts, and we would have forces that would, we would through the Emergency Military Assistance Compact, we would be a donor state. That's what we thought. About Maybe uh, a day, the day before the storm got to northern New England, it, it went what storms are not supposed to do. Low pressure system is not supposed to go left. It's supposed to go out to sea, but it didn't. And it lined up Vermont on the sites, and then it stalled out. And that's what crushed us, was the storm slowed down more and dumped up. When we were in my command center, and General Cray was, was, uh, was in a leadership position, with us that time, and what I, we couldn't believe the reports we were getting from the southern part of the state. So that's mistake number one. We were incredulous. It wasn't that bad where we were at. And, and psychologically, I couldn't imagine, how could it be that much worse? It's only maybe 100 miles south. I mean, and so the reports we were getting were almost unbelievable. The devastation, and then we started we had quick reaction forces, like all the states had quick reaction forces for DISCA. And so by early afternoon, all the quick reaction forces were deployed. They were gone. We were, we were, so then we happened to have members of the National Guard that happened to be drilling out of a battalion, which is probably about 600 people in <coughs> some different places. So we pushed those out the door by, like, say, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But we were basically out of Schlitz at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And the storm was just getting up. So that was mistake number one, was not, not, not having a hard time believing what we were hearing. Number two was, we should have probably anticipated that the storm could have done this to us and had more people ready. And then the third thing was, you know, was two days later, and this was probably the biggest mistake, is we were, you know, I was with the governor almost nonstop for the first 48 hours. We were, we were coordinating to bring in, our helicopters were in Iraq, so we were coordinating to bring in more helicopters. And, but we were doing everything almost you know, step by step by step. What we should have been doing is realizing that we had to do things differently than we always did, because that's how big it is. This was the biggest disaster in our state, probably in the history of the state, 
1927 flood was bad, but uh, for devastation, this was worse. There was more loss of life in 27, but the damage was worse. Economically, it was a lot worse. And we just weren't thinking ahead of the storm. And then when Mr. Fugate showed up from FEMA, and I said this earlier, but I believe in my heart, he, he's a national asset. He's probably the best disaster expert in the entire world. And we're lucky that the president can convince him to stick around, because he was going to leave a couple years ago. He's that good. But when he showed up and immediately saw that we were not me, I was in, I was in charge, we were not out ahead of this thing. He, he knew by his experience, and that's when he yelled at me. Yeah. <laughs> Many times he yelled at me. And everything he said when he, I don't know, he didn't yell at me personally. He raised his voice and said, you know, do he, you know, we know each other. But we said, you need to do this and this. <coughs> he was kind of this aha moment of, wow, yeah, he's right. But see, he had been to so many disasters, he could immediately ascertain that we were behind. And with the, you know, direct guidance from him in a nanosecond, we were out getting ahead. Probably two things, uh, and probably most of you uh, still have one more theory. Uh, one being, of course, 9 11, and I won't go into too much detail, but that was more of, for us in the Guard, it was a security event. I was the uh, operations chief for the uh, Army National Guard, and, and uh, just that shock of trying to figure out what's first, what's the regulation, how do we pay for it, what authorities do we have. We're going into airports, but we're all going to go into active duty installations, we're going to close down 12 borders. <coughs> And, and you really went back to the basics I mean, overnight almost. But, but that's another whole topic. I really wanted to key in on domestic operations. And my watershed event that really woke me up was Katrina, no doubt. Uh, serving as the deputy director for the Army Guard. And I remember preparing, we put about 40 helicopters in the Mississippi, Louisiana. We had to keep them fairly out of the way of the winds. And we put them in a few days before the storm hit. But but compared to the planning we do today, there was very little of that at the national level to assist the states. We didn't even really understand how the states were planning for the event. And uh, when the event hit in the first morning, uh, you really couldn't see much. You couldn't, you couldn't tell much. And we couldn't even really talk to anyone. Uh, Louisiana, Jackson Barracks was right the you know, ground zero. Mississippi was more of a, of a consequence measure because the storm came through, wiped out, and went on then. New Orleans was, was the big problem. Now you had a crisis to deal with. And I remember that General Blum was the chief at the time. He got a hold of both of the Adjutant General and the Adjutant General of the Louisiana. They said, we don't know how bad it is. Send us 7,000, each one of us. Uh, 7,000 what? Yeah. How do you want them to design? Yeah. When do you need them? Where do you want them to go? Uh, we, we don't, we got to go with the government. Bye. Send us 7,000. So trying to formulate a plan to move 7,000 troops, how quick can you get them there? And, and what really stressed the system, in fact, Florida had a lot of good experience with ships in Florida, lawyers over there uh, that had worked for King and his numbers, but what really stressed, stressed the system here um, was command control. There wasn't a command control. Probably didn't need to be command control, but we put in fine unity of effort to work with it. So we plugged our folks into the parish. President, and that's usually where we start or with the mayor. And uh, as we went on, what we found was we weren't we weren't covering this in the press very well at all. That we actually had troops out there, and it got to a point uh, to almost where I think the president almost fled to us. And there was one day we had a task force of 1,300, Task Force Lone Star, and they were coming out of uh, out of Texas. We didn't know where they were. We couldn't talk with them at the time. A convoy that had supplies, and when they get the word, they called in and said, "We're at the border. We don't know whether we have an emergency management compact or not." And I said, "Look, people are dying. Move. Go across the border. We'll sort the rest out. We'll return to us later, but we can't talk to them right now." When they rolled in, actually, General Blum was on Air Force One at the time with the president. They had gone down. And he was very close to federalizing this because he said it was dysfunctional, and uh, and the president. Uh, said, hey, how can you guarantee you've got these forces going in? And just about that time, I think it was Fox News, showed them coming into the city, into the high waters, you know, those, those trucks coming in. And then we actually knew there was something. But, but it was in the line. I mean, we couldn't track it. We didn't know where it was. We just started shoving 
and, and I do know the difference today. And we're much more proactive and we plan and exercise more than we ever did before. So um, all of you have uh, discussed in some way together sort of the communications challenge with domestic uh, threats, mostly because it's just not your voice. It's uh, multiple voices. So I want to ask a two-part question in this regard, and we'll just keep going around like this if that's okay. The, the first is, um, how do you communicate success in a world in which success is often, well, only three people died at the marathon, only this much oil got to shore, only in which the narrative is never that good, given the world that you all work in. And then secondly, how do you communicate in the interagency uh, um, what the roles are, given all these different pieces that are coming together? I mean, you know what you do. Um, and so I was just wondering, because those seem to be particular challenges that are going to get cut, cut across in a domestic event. Charlie? Yeah. Um, I think that, that in the military, so for the everyone in uniform knows this, but you know, we're never, we, we should never be out in front. We, you know, we should be supporting. Now, I'm, I'm talking about <laughs> my current job at the military command. I'm on, on Title 10 active duty. But even if you're from a state, same thing, you know, you should be in support of your governor. So, you know, I, I cut my teeth with on uh, with my a new governor. So I've been working for one governor for four and a half years, and we went through a number of crises and we lost a lot of soldiers overseas. And so we we had, had a really strong personal and professional relationship, and we had done some disasters. New governor gets elected, brand new, and. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I mean, it's kind of strange, but the like, guy beat my brother by one percentage point <laughs> for governor. <laughs> now this is this is real, you know. And wow. and the, the, the first crisis I had was he had the audacity to ask me to escort his family into the state house to be sworn in. <laughs> and I'll tell you, you can say, "Well, oh, we're professional," you know. <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
here in D.C., so that's why Paul was prepared to solve it. Well, in this job, no, I'll kind of focus my comments about the job as the chief, and my interaction primarily goes, you know, I'm getting information directly from the adjutant general when there's a crisis. And uh, in fact, uh, Catfish and I had a number of these that we've uh, and he said, you know, after talking to the governor, I'm the first person he calls. And being a member on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as well as uh, being able to advise you know, the Secretary of Defense on the non-federalized guard, uh, getting that information quick from the adjutants, you know, is, is, I think it's just, uh, we talked a little bit today about it, it's, it's one of those things, if you don't do it, uh, and you know this better than anyone, the city of Washington will watch the news and they'll begin to churn where in, we talked today about a situation that was actually the Boston bombings. When I came out of the meeting, we were in a tank session where all the decisions are up to the secretary or given these and money surprises. And that day we had had a session, the bomb had gone off. I had a note, walked up to Chairman Dempsey and briefed him real quick. He went in and informed the secretary. And I immediately got called in to a number of updates that I normally would sit in with the secretary Hagel. And I found comparing that to other events I had worked in uh, before being in the job that you don't get that information up quickly to the federal leadership so they understand you're going to probably get more help than you really need. And, and even to a point where you know, during Hurricane Sandy, I know that uh, uh, Ray, Ray saw this many times with their shields there. Uh, we saw this a lot uh, in New York where the microscope is on you. That microscope might be a lens through news channel. And me being able to talk to his boss, Pat Murphy, and get that information directly to the leadership. And, and then help them shape what they might need to do. Or, and stay out of their business as much as can, they can. And really, the business that we're in is to support the first responder and make them successful in their jobs. Well, I would first say, initial information is usually about 80% long. Um, so, so don't start by quoting and spouting out the numbers. Uh, because those numbers will take you to your knees uh, in terms of how you do any public messaging. Most events are not going to get off to a great start, and that's where you want to get in front of it. As soon as it's going well, plenty of people will crowd your space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's always lonely at the podium when you, when you come in second place. But just some thought about how do you use social media? Uh, and so we have this challenge in terms of just credibility during the deep water horizon, the oil spill. I will, Alan would speak, I would speak, but people say, well, they're nothing more than spin doctors. And so they'll create this application that's called ERMA, E-R-M-A, Emergency Response Management Application. And so how can I put this on steroids to put air tracks, surface tracks, GPS encrypted photos, so anyone can navigate through this, and then they can discern for themselves and pass judgment on how is this response will really go. And so we're able to put that online. The first day it went online, we had 200,000 or so hits. Day two, it was nearly 3 million. So people are now getting their news by going to Burma and not necessarily believing what Anderson Cooper 360 is saying, that this is the truth. And they can actually manipulate information. But if people feel like they can have some ownership, and then objectively assess information rather than have it fed to them from one source, whether it's from national media or you know, one of us. But the more transparent we can be, we can never be transparent enough. For us, that was a game changer in terms of building credibility uh, and getting our public message out. That's great. Um, so, all of you have discussed, and all of you worked through various administrations, various parties, so this is politics with a little bit. Uh, but we talk about in the class and uh, uh, about managing up, essentially the political beast um, that will panic probably sooner than you, uh, that will not know that most emergencies look really bad at the beginning, um, and then will think that there's some alternative universe where it would be going better, and they're going to find it for you. Um, and we just speak from experience. And so, um, so I'm sort of curious about if you could give advice or what you've learned about this notion of managing up uh, a political beast that has, has has to be responsible, responsive, or doesn't have to, but is watching Anderson Cooper and thinking, what's up with my Coast Guard, for example? But I'll start with you. Wow. Uh, 
he can definitely have to spend some time uh, as a disaster starts to understand which party, which person's from. Because that's going to make a difference. And especially if it's an election year. And then try to understand that in the context of the size of the disaster. And how can you influence that? And I always tell staff when we get into debates sometimes uh, back at the uh, National Guard Bureau, and we do some exercise, participate in some national level exercises. I tell them that, you know, Science is good, but inside Washington, inside the political apparatus of the United States, at all levels, that's an art. You've got to understand it. And if you don't understand that, I mean, the science can be 100% right, but you're, I've seen it happen, and you're going down the tube. So I think you've got to spend time early on uh, understanding where it's at, who's in charge, who, you know, who are you going to come together as partners, uh, what is their political affiliation, and what are, what are their, you know, their heartburns especially if you don't have to
was it worth flying with all these military airplanes, flying these huge power trucks across the country to New York? Well, first off, the president said do it. So guess what? We all, in uniform, we all, right, Captain? We know what to do. We salute, we move out, and we got the power trucks there. Okay, remember I talked about the personal space, the optic and all that stuff? Do you know what was on the front page of almost every paper in the United States and on CNN and Fox? Was the first power truck coming off a C-5 at Stewart Field. The, the, remember I said a lot of this is showing, showing people that you, you're doing something. Now, did we need the trucks? I don't know. I'm not a power expert. Now, did they, they use the trucks? Yeah, they used the trucks. Now, I don't know if we could have done it more efficiently by getting all the trucks from the East Coast and drop. I don't know that. All I know is, first off, the president says, do it. We're going to do it. <clears throat> and second off, it really had a common effect that everything was being done. Now, was the was Sandy response perfect? No. Am I really, am I proud of Sandy? Yeah, I know. I think, because I had a little to do with Katrina, and I think, Sandy was the manifestation of a lot of hard work at the Congress, <coughs> the Department of Defense, creating the dual status commander, and then implementing a new unity of command that we never thought would even be in place. So there was a lot of good things about Sandy. But there's always politics, and it's just the way it is. So when they tell you to move the power, use this as a metaphor. When someone tells you to move the power trucks, just say yes, sir. <laughs> So this panel about interagency coordination, most of it, you know, a lot of a lot of the examples are from natural disasters um, and working within the local and state well-known FEMA apparatus, uh, or maybe it's actually the local and state emergency management apparatus, and how can you actually support it? Um, but there's a number of emerging threats, and we can't even predict what they're going to be, uh, and um, uh, whether it's cyber or Ebola that are uh, going to either require, because you have to show that you're doing something even if the threat's not a big deal, require new agency partnerships that might not have been thought of before, or um, uh, a, a looking at something like cyber, for example, of which there's multiple overships, DHS, DOD, states, localities. So I'm going to start with you just on the emergency threat issue that might strain the more typical unified command that we tend to know in natural disasters or in, in or even uh, uh, response. Um, Ebola, uh, you know, now there's a czar. Is he still there? Now there's a czar. And there's just a different governance structure than what, what anyone in Mexico or, or cyber or whatever might be. Yeah. Well, I'll pick on Ebola first just because we've been through this with all the uh, H1N1 contingency plan. Uh, and when you do the exercises, everyone gets along, and one state says, hey, I've got ex excess you know, antivirus, be glad to help you out, uh, and everyone gets along. So when you look at oil boom, uh, and you move oil boom from Alabama to Louisiana, uh, and now you have governors blockading highways, uh, so boom can't move across the I-10 corridor. Uh, you know, what happens in practice doesn't always happen in reality. Look at our plan for Ebola. Uh, we had an event. Uh, it was a, one of the nurses was on a cruise ship with 4,000 passengers, uh, 1,500 crew members, and uh, she was about 18 days since exposure. Uh, she was not symptomatic. The ship was pulling into Belize. The president of Belize said the ship can't stop here. So if they go on to Cancun, the president of Mexico says can't stop here either. That, that was at that point my director, Jay Johnson, was <coughs> rise to the president. What are we going to do about this? The ship left Galveston. Um, and so we didn't have a plan. So we flew a helicopter out. We drew blood. We flew it up to Austin. Uh, it came back. You know, there was no positive indication. But we moved all the way down to the local level. We got the state involved. We got the governor involved. First responders. Instead of taking the emotional trauma of this out of Washington, D.C., put it back in the hands of the local. We can do this. We've done H1N1. This is Ebola. Um, and so the fact that it did come back negative, then the ship was allowed in. Um, but all of that was decided ultimately at the local level. And that's really how we ended up diffusing that. Um, cyber, we can probably talk on that for quite a while. But we're actively involved in cyber uh, as you look at state sponsors.
concert activity going after the commercial sector, SCADA systems, energy sector shut down, and then it's no different than if you just had a, a major natural disaster. But some of those very same contingencies that we, if you look at the natural response framework, now you're dealing with the consequence. Um, and I think we focus on the consequence management, not the attribution aspect as first responders. That's really where our role in focus is going to be. Coming on Ebola, so so simultaneously, uh, Dallas kind of kicked <coughs> in the can. Remember, that's how it started. And so they they were looking at Northern Command because it's in our area, and we gave the old.
was so critical in the Cuban Marta Haiti operation when we were bringing back 21,000 U.S. citizens to the United States when they were hitting three different airports in Florida. I had no clue before that that HHS was so small, a very small organization, and they work a lot on grants to the state government. So we were trying to figure out how do we get forces in there, and we want them to ask under some sort of a statute or maybe it's the Stafford Act and no one's asking for it. And uh, they said, well, we give the money to the states. And so we had to work through that. And I think the same thing on all these borders. I did want to say something about cyber for just a second. Uh, the governors have come to the Pentagon. Uh, we have a council of governors. We have 10 governors. that has been around about three years now. Very successful uh, body. And we just talk about issues that defense and the guard and the governors have in common and things we're thinking about for the future. And about two years ago, the governors and Secretary and Secretary and Paul Cannell at that time came in and said, uh, you know, we really have to get after this and we need your help on this defense. And the Guard was very interested. There were some uh, folks on the Hill that were interested in giving us something in legislation to help side with civil support teams. I was very concerned at the time we were going to grow a capability, but we didn't want to need it. I mean, we need the cyber, but we need it to look like the Army and Air Force. So we could use it on the federal mission. We would understand how to interact with FBI, with uh, DHS, with cyber and the components. And at the same time, that would give us the capability to function and support the states and the governors. So we had that understanding from all levels, from state active duty to a federalization. And so uh, what we're doing now is we're actually standing up, uh, I think by this time next year, we should have about 30 cyber units, mostly defensive units, cyber protection units. Uh, we'll be positioned around the states where we can take our men and from the guard, try to draw from pockets of expertise in industry. Uh, I don't want to many industries, but uh, we're, we're looking at those units will have a very small full-time staff, but they'll have that ability to ramp up when needed, whether it's for the governor or whether it's for our federal side. And we'll train the same as we have. And uh, that's going to pay us a lot of money. It's the hard part, though, every time we get into this one, just to give you a quick example, we ran an exercise uh, with FBI, DHS, Cybercom, and their components. Uh, we ran a West Coast exercise out of uh, Port of Seattle. And it was played out, I think, very realistic. So the Port of Seattle comes under attack, and the cyber attack shuts down the port. They don't know what's coming in, they don't know what's going out. Does this sound familiar? Well, they shut down Long Island. Everything's beginning to stack up. Uh, the industry is starting to scream. People are getting laid off. And same time, was about 40% of defense comes through the port. Huge amount of defense. Well, defense was saying in the scenario, well, we need to take this over. The private company, public and private public partnerships there said, no, you're not going to take this over. So Cybercom tells the little cell. We have this cell in Washington State, probably one of our more experienced, populated by a couple of very well-known companies that are in the IT business out west in Seattle. And, and they work there every day. And so they went into the cell and said, look, uh, if, they, if the Attorney General allows us to come into, into your organization, will you let us sit at your computers? And then we will talk back to Cybercom and see if we can find out what's going on. So they did, and in the scenario, they found the malware. And they're talking to cyber. Now they're in state active duty under governor control. And they reach back to Cybercom. <coughs> Cybercom says, Yes, we've seen this before. Here's what you need to fix it. And then they fix the problem. Now, the part that the lawyers went crazy about was what we touched inside there. Was that a state responsibility? Was that a federal responsibility? Who's, who's in charge? Um, nobody's really in charge in cyberspace. But, but who's going to pay the bills if there's a lawsuit here that you got into proprietary information? That you shouldn't have touched it. So the authorities piece has got to be tackled. I want to make sure we have time for all of you, so I'm going to stop now and open it up to questions. If you could direct them, or if it's for all three, if you could, we'll try to do this um, uh, fast response so we can get as many questions in. So if you stand up while I, and identify yourself or after I. <coughs> Sir, uh, Representative Hank Naughton, how are you? Hi, Good to see you. Uh, I'm the chair of uh, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Committee in the House here. So I'm one of those guys, Admiral, that sits up in the chairs. And <laughs> can I, I can um, say one thing? He's at least in a uniform. We used to have to testify with him and, and, and Neppinger and others, and they're all fawning over, oh, thank you for your service, whatever. Then they look at someone who's in civilian clothes and go, that's when you get funky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
I'm an Army reservist, and I, and I was asked why they didn't put a uniform tonight. And looking around, I said, when I show up as Chairman Naughton, I get some level of deference. When I show up at Major Naughton, as Major Naughton, <laughs> <laughs> I'm parking cars. <laughs> what I would, just as a, as a point to, from this side, in, in that reserve status kind of gives me a, a, a bit of a perspective and a, a tremendous relationship uh, with General Rice and his entire staff and, and the Guard here. And, and it's open, we talk a lot. Uh, the, the, the Guard comes under my committee in the, in the legislature. Uh, and, and I would just suggest to put that out there. Just have that, uh, the appropriate officials within your state legislatures. I know some aren't as, uh, as probably built up and as, as statutorily powerful as, as we are here in Massachusetts. But, and so, and I think what that happens, what that would help with is it allows you to understand the demands on the electeds and, and the calls that are coming to us from our constituents and people. We had major flooding in my district a few years ago. I mean, the, the phones you know, rang off the hook, the garden was fantastic. Um, and, and just to have that, that two-way conversation there uh, on, the, on the state level. I, I know, I, sir, I went to your swap ball ceremony too, uh, with, with General. I, I, and I, I, know you're, I, I, know, I know you're, I know you're governor. We, you know, he's, he's had a few laughs with him. Uh, <laughs> it, so I would just, I would put that out there for you to, to, to have that open uh, dialogue, uh, especially, uh, more, actually more for, for, for the tags and the A-tag. Uh, because it's incredibly helpful when, when it hits the fan and you know, I know I can call you know, General Rice or I know I can call you know, the Colonel. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's very helpful in our end because uh, it, it, those in, in my position are a lot, of, a lot of pressures on us as well. So, but it's, it's, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. That's for a great point. Thank you. I'm just following up on it. We have plans for 20 committees and subcommittees. And so I actually mentioned the other service chiefs. You yeah. had a couple of top chairmen to deal with, but that aside. So I proactively go out and campaign with each and every one of them, including the brand new freshmen, because as soon as something goes bad, boom, they're, they're going to convene a hearing. Um, so as long as I'm not dealing with a catastrophe right now, you know, the calm of the storm, at least develop those relationships first and foremost. When we're called into a hearing, you know, at least you've had coffee together, you've broken bread together, and that takes some of the tension out of, out of what could otherwise be a very natural moment this year. That's perfect. Thank you for that. Um, you know, for many of us, combat engineer, um, you know, we want to run away from Capitol Hill. And what I've learned <laughs> is, uh, especially especially as a three and and some of you in this room are going to be competing for those jobs at the national level. You've got to engage. I mean, over 50% of my time now is spent educating our elected officials. If you don't do that, you know, you'll lose resources. They won't understand what you need to do. They won't understand you. They, they're great to work with. Uh, yeah, they, you know, they'll have their own areas that they have to be responsible for their constituents, but, but you've got to get to the Hill and you've got to make that a priority, uh, especially when, you know, when you're, the budget season's coming around and you're trying to get your posture taken out for the future. Steve Cray, I'm the Adjutant General for Vermont. My question is to uh, General Grass. Sir, could you uh, maybe to build on that a little bit is, in your role as the Chief of the National Guard Bureau and a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, sort of talk about your approach to advocating during these hearings, the posture hearings that are going on right now, for the National Guard that is in large part, uh, you know, uh, funded by the federal government to do a federal mission, but is used in this, this this course has been taught this, this week in a, in a domestic response. How you approach that and, and, and what is your thoughts on, on advocating specifically to keep, keep that guard strong sure. and that equipment? One of the, the, the challenges I think that uh, I deal with is uh, walking this fine line between working closely with the Adjutant General and the governors and working for the Secretary of Defense and the President. And I think Paul would, would relate setting in on our joint chief sessions too. There's times we make decisions behind code, or not decisions, but recommendations up to the secretary that he may take to the president. And we're doing that behind closed doors, and you want to make a decision as a body. And I, and I thought about this a number of times last year during testimony. Of what, you, you never want to walk out of that room and go against them. I mean, you have the debate behind closed doors because how does that look to us? 
So that, that can actually put us at odds at times. And we went through this with the Air Force a few years ago. Of course, there's a commission now. We're kind of going through that with the Army. Um, although I would tell you, you know, our relationship with the Air Force out of that process is stronger than it's ever been. I'm hoping you know, we will do the same. A lot of this comes out of when you're fighting for the same resources. So our resources uh, for the National Guard that you all get come from the Army and Air Force for the most part. I mean, maybe you know, three to four percent at the larger states that actually the states pay. And so uh, finding that, that balancing line where it still represents you, and part of that ties into what we call the, the dual use equipment. Because that's a big part of the bill. Is uh, what can we tie to what you need in the homeland? Uh, not only equipment, but also command and control growth. Uh, how do we grow leaders just like this course? You know, I've got to find money to, to put this course on uh, for you all. And these are the types of things that will grow our leaders. And if I can explain that on the Hill and to the Army and Air Force, we'll get the support we need. Dell and Utah. Questions from everyone wants to take it. Um, majority of the time when we're responding to domestic uh, emergencies, we're going into the good guys. Um, saving lives, distributing food, clearing roads, and so forth. But in a case like a Ferguson, Missouri, how does how does your guidance um, you know, to tags with other senior leaders, does it change, how does it change as we're sending soldiers and airmen into an environment, hostile, non-combative, but certainly something where maybe the masses are appreciating Showing up. Uh, let me just, that's just, that was, that was still on our plate a bit. I mean, we're doing after action reviews. And uh, early on, the Adjutant General, uh, you know, Steve Danner, called me up and said the governor wants to put guardsmen out in the streets, uh, which was great to, to hear that early on. So I could share that with the chairman, I could share that with the secretary of staff. So if all of a sudden he sees U.S. Army or U.S. Air Force standing in the streets of Ferguson. I want, I want them to understand what the rules of engagement are by state law. I want them to understand they're under governor control. And I want to get their feedback. And Chairman Dempsey, when I first kind of briefed him on it, he said, uh, so are they going to be armed? I said, well, by state law, they can arm. But the tag has told me, and the governor, uh, Governor Nixon, uh, has told him that you know, we're going to try to fill in uh, other police stations other shopping malls, other power banks, power stations, and then push the police closer in as much as possible. That was the first round. And uh, really, that went pretty well, except that when uh, all of a sudden you started seeing this militarized equipment running in the streets. And then the press picked that up and said, what's the military doing there? So I got called into Secretary Hagel's office and he said, we, we actually figured out that most of that equipment, they bought on, you know, on the open market. They didn't get it. But we had to explain that to the press and others that we didn't militarize them. They, they got it. Now, some cities do get that type of equipment. Um, spin that forward to the second round. Uh, there was a lot of preparation going on before the grand jury announcement. And there was 2,000 guardsmen. They were out of the way. Uh, very intentional to keep them out. And I recommend to the tags all the time, if we can keep our men and women in uniform out of the view, especially in a law enforcement type of event. That's the best for the nation. And I think most of them do agree. Now, state laws will allow them to go in and execute the laws of the state in many cases. In this case, all the guardsmen are out and down again, a couple thousand of them. Uh, the riots started that night. 150 shots were fired, not by the police, by individuals shooting in the air, shooting at each other. I think there were a few injured, no one was killed. The 27 buildings burned down because no one can control that crowd. Uh, so the governor then is taking heat for that now uh, because people are saying he should have had the National Guard in front of him. I called him one day after this was over and I said, uh, Governor Nixon, I said, I, I think you did the right thing because you can rebuild 27 businesses and that's bad. But thinking about one or two airmen or soldiers standing there and one bullet hits one of them, we could have had some sort of mess. And I think it's something you all have to take into consideration. I mean, you're still going to take the heat one way or the other, but no one's killed in the first one after the gunshots. Anyone else want to take one? Yeah, Would I see hand?
some of my fellow students are, what you say, part of more of the activist band, and they'll take a different look at her. And one of their concerns is all they understand habeas corpus and keeps us out of the keeps us out of the streets for law enforcement purposes. To them, it's the same. The SWAT team looks like a rifle. And to them, it doesn't matter whether the back says police or army. They see the same amount of force being brought to bear. I mean, what frightens them is that this militarized force is the force that stays in their community every day. It's not a federal force that comes down in extreme emergency and then goes away. They're there every day, and they're essentially a military force in their community. And that frightens them, at least according to a few of my peers, more than a military force that comes into the federal control. <laughs> And I wonder how you balance that. It's good that we're not getting involved and no one's getting shot by a guardsman. But it also seems like the police are outclassed trying to perform as a military force, where that is our role in society. Once the weapons go from single shot to automatic, some people feel it's our business. You know, I'm going to ask Mike, uh, as a former editor general, to answer that. Because, you know, <laughs> I would say that, you know, in my, my Experience that you're dealing, and I'm not no disrespect to the, the people who are expressing that to you, but I would say that's a really small minority of the American people. And I would I would argue my 36 years, almost 36 years in uniform, I've never felt the appreciation of the American people like I do today. All over the country, I used to feel it was you know where I was from. <clears throat> Colorado is over the top. Never seen a com community that supports men and women in the military. So I think. I understand what you're saying, but going back to the optic, the, the community-based force, which is the National Guard and the, re the rest of the reserve components, I think do more to make good relations when there is nothing bad going on. So when there is something bad, they don't see the people from the local armory as this, you know, invasion federal force. They see it as their neighbors who are coming out. Now, they may have to be doing a job that no one wants to do, like Ferguson. I agree with General Grass. So this is, Ferguson is the exact opposite of what I was saying earlier. In a disaster, you want to be out front, you want to get the, get on the press, you want to have them see you, you want to, you know, that's all good. So to clarify, I may have misspoke. Their perception was about the police force. Oh, as okay. a military force that is in their community, okay. not towards the guard. They okay. actually fear the police have become militarized. <coughs> and they stay there every day, whereas the guard comes in when needed and then leaves. I think what, then, I, then to answer you, I think what, what you just um, referenced is a bigger problem for our American society, unfortunately. And if anything, if anything good is maybe started because of Ferguson, not that I wish it had, is bringing out the very point about the police force in America that we have to have this dialogue. And now I'm talking as a citizen, not a military guy. As an American citizen, we have to collectively have this dialogue about our police force because there's part of our society looks at them as there's some type of a military force that can't be trusted. But I think all of us in, it, in this room probably agree. I mean, the police force in America by and large is the best law enforcement force in the world. But it's that perception we have to overcome. Thanks. Last question. <coughs> Sir, uh, my question to General Grass. I'm Colonel Rich Johnson. I came in the 26th Brigade, but it's also the home and response force for uh, Inner Region 1. And my question is regarding that. Um, how do you see the Seaburn response mission you know, as it stands now, <coughs> as it might grow? And I kind of know how we inherited it because we got good at all these things we're talking about and now we're kind of employing another expertise to see where in response and I know General York is involved in that enterprise as well. Um, you know, we're not funded yet, sir. It's not appropriate. Is it going to be a program of record? Is it going to remain a contingency funded mission? And my real question is kind of at the lower level. Our soldiers are now wearing two hats in this uniform plus their other hat in their civilian just a lot to ask of our guys. It's pretty difficult to meet the training requirements and certifications. Yeah. Uh, just to get everybody on the same sheet, um, we stood out with capabilities in the U.S. military. Uh, really, the first part of this uh, chem bio nuclear response capability started uh, late 90s, designed in the early 2000s, the first civil support teams, a small team 
National Guardsmen that are trained up. Uh, they have you know, chem, bio, nuclear, decon capability, small decon capability. Mostly it's uh, detection. And there are 22 person teams. There's one in every state, and three states actually have two. Uh, what grew out of that was it was a larger element that could actually do decon and treat patients coming out of the dirty area uh, with medical and then transport and then security. So we grew these over the time frame, about 2009, 10 time frame, uh, we changed it a bit because it was more national at the larger scale. We had the, the teams in every state, but the, the large response capability to, to do the decon and medical was at the federal level. Uh, in fact, uh, probably one of the commanders was in here, Bob, uh, 218 was one of our first yes, a brigade, but it was in South Carolina. But how do we get South Carolina to respond to something in Seattle? You know, when you get there, like Craig Tugay says, if you're not there within 72 hours, you know, you're going to be sending body bags. So we, we reorganized the whole, the whole we call it the suburban industry, or the suburban response uh, enterprise now. And we built these, what you're talking about, the Homeland Response Force, it's a battalion of about 560. And it's got, uh, it's got decon capability, it's got medical capability, got some security to come with the command and control. And uh, now there's one in every team region. And then we have a company size element, which is very similar, but it's on a smaller scale without the security. We have 17 of those scattered around the United States. So we've got a local, then you ramp it up to a more large scale response, all the way to, we have three federal teams that Mike deals with every day, a defense uh, suburban response force, which is about 4,000 4, now. And then there's two more larger, about a thousand each, of command and control elements. We've never had this before. Uh, we did test it a little bit. Uh, actually, uh, we tested it in the Vancouver Olympics, where Canada had asked us, could you put something on call? Which we did. We put a, a, some small elements on call in Washington State. The issues that we're dealing with today, though, I mean, many countries actually are watching what we're doing. Uh, in fact, the, the British put an LNO at one time out in the North Town to see this. They wanted to see what this, this was. So you have uh, this capability of about 18,000 today. And 70% is guard, some reserve, and then some active duty. But it comes from all kinds of units. So his unit has a mission to be able to respond to whatever FEMA region you're in uh, as the Homeland Response Force. They also have a mission to respond when the president calls to mobilize them. So they're trying to train for two different missions at the same time. Now, I'm just going to give you my mission. Maybe some of the adjutants here might want to hang me before this is done. But I've watched this develop over the time, and we've got great expertise out there. But I think in the long term, we've got to build this as organizations within the Army and Air National Guard that are standalone organizations to do this mission. And I think. What we should do, though, is we should also make them available for foreign consequence management in time of crisis, like the Fukushima plant. And I think that would be a decision by the governor, by the Secretary of Defense at the time. You know, if there was a threat here in the homeland that there might be a dirty bomb going off, we probably wouldn't send them. But I think having that dual mission role, uh, we, we can no longer afford to have, you know, as, as Secretary uh, uh, Mel used to say, you can't have any more one-trick ponies, so get rid of them. So I think being able to do that in an organized unit right now, there are a conglomeration of units that come together to form this capability. So that's really what uh, I've been talking with some of the adjutants in general about trying to formalize that as just any other unit. Okay, we do have to call it quits. I want to um, first of all thank again um, Arn and Dutch, uh, General Rice, and your team that were amazing. I see some of them, and you could just stand up and thank you all for being here.